What's happening around the world and what's happening here at home? A very good evening to you and welcome to Weekend Primetime News. I'm Sandro Ferdinando. Now before we get into our stories in detail, let's take a quick look at your headlines for tonight. One person killed after an elevator crashed at a nightclub in Colombo. Sumandiran says it was he who urged that Swaminathan be removed from the ministerial position. Extraordinary Gazette notification issued with the respective subjects. Ministries with no state institutions are also included. Opposition leader Mahindraj Paksa says the lifespan of the government is too short. First up in some heartbreaking news, a valuable life of a youth was taken away by a tragic incident this morning. He died after an elevator crash at a nightclub located down Namamartha Slave Island and two others were also injured in the incident. I am reporting here from Naman Mavata here in Colombo 2 where a tragic incident has taken place to a youth who has died in an elevator accident and two others are also being reported injured and are currently in hospital. A group including the 24-year-old Kokila Samanda Peruma arrived at the building at around 2 this morning. The group had entered into the elevator to go to a nightclub located on the ninth floor. It is suspected that the elevator had crashed from the first floor to the ground floor of the building. The two youth who were injured in the accident were hospitalized. Kokila Samanda Peruma was a resident of Talangama North. Kokila, who played for CRN FC, was well recognized as a promising rugby player. Well known as Marco among his peers, Kokila's death comes as a shock to the entire rugby community who mourns his death. The fire brigade arrived at the location when the incident took place. How was the situation when you went there? Every elevator can only carry a certain weight. We think around 15 people had been in the elevator when the maximum amount allowed to carry was 10. There are buttons and we suspect a wrong button might have been pressed. That is how this person has fallen into this. He was stuck between the elevator and the floor. Except for his hand, his entire body was stuck in between. I have been in service for 23 years and this is the first time I came across a situation like this. We faced difficulties in recovering his body. Two officers from my crew held the lift and that's when we were able to go down there and recover his body. Now this is not the first incident of this matter that has taken place here in Colombo. Now during a construction of a building, a government representative is selected to overlook the regulations and conditions of the construction building. But the question is, is a representative selected by the government to overlook the construction of an elevator shaft in those construction zones? Now we can see that there are high-rise buildings coming up in Colombo every other day and the question still remains, is there a representative to overlook the construction of an elevator shaft in those high-rise buildings here in Colombo? Who is responsible for the safety of elevators? When news first inquired from the Colombo Municipal Council and the Urban Development Authority, the officers said that these do not come under their purview. Therefore. Who will take the responsibility when such incidents take place in public places? The Municipal Council is mainly to be blamed. We can only determine whether it is a civil or criminal offence based on the documents provided to the relevant institutions. Continuing in more local news, an extraordinary Gazette notification was issued last night highlighting the subject functions and state institutions which come under relevant cabinet and non-cabinet ministers. However, when analyzing this Gazette notification, several questions can be raised as to whether the people are being deceived. The reason for such questions to arise is because certain ministries do not have any state institutions allocated under them. 
The Ministry of Defence, which comes under the purview of the President, has 21 state institutions under it, including the Police Department, National Dangerous Drugs Control Board, National Media Centre and the State Printers Department. 22 state institutions have been allocated under the Mahaveli Development and Environment Ministry, which is also headed by the President. The Ministry of National Policies, Economic Affairs, Resettlement and Rehabilitation, Northern Province Development, Vocational Training and Skills Development and Youth Affairs, which are overlooked by the Prime Minister, have 24 state institutions falling under its purview. According to this Gazette notification, the Ministry of Finance and Mass Media has 48 ministries allocated under it. This is the largest number of state institutions which have been assigned for a single ministry. The central bank and all state banks fall under the purview of the Ministry of Finance and Mass Media, according to this Gazette notification. Minister of Public Enterprise, Candy and Heritage and Candy Development Lakshman Kiriala has four state institutions allocated to his ministry. These institutions include the Ceylon Ceramics Corporation, Kahagolla Engineering Service Company Limited, BCC Lanka Limited and State Resources Management Corporation. An interesting fact which is highlighted here is even though Minister Kiriala also holds office as the Minister of Candy and Heritage and Candy Development, no relevant institutions have been allocated to fall under his purview. Seven state institutions have been given to Minister Ravi Karna Nayaka, who is the Minister of Power, Energy and Enterprise Development. These include the Ceylon Electricity Board and companies controlled by it, the Lanka Electricity Company and the Sri Lanka Sustainable Energy Authority. 26 agencies have been handed over to Minister Sajid Premadasa, who is the Minister of Housing, Construction and Cultural Affairs. The Department of Archaeology and Central Cultural Fund, which earlier fell under the purview of the Ministry of Education, have been handed over to Minister Sajid Premadasa, according to this Gazette. The National Film Corporation, National Housing Development Board, as well as the State Engineering Corporation, falls under the purview of Minister Sajid Premadasa. Minister Premadasa has also been handed over Gaul Heritage, which was earlier a part of the subject of Southern Development. Three state institutions have been handed over to the Ministry of Buddha Sasana and Vyamba Development. They are the Department of Buddhist Affairs, Buddha Sasana Fund and the International Buddhist Centre. Although Vyamba Development has also been handed over to Gamini Javikrama Pereira, no relevant authorities have been allocated. Sandrani Bandara, who is the Minister of Women and Child Affairs and Dry Zone Development, she has only been allocated five institutions which pertain to Women and Child Affairs. No institutions have been allocated for the subject of Dry Zone Development. While Sagara Ratnaika is the Minister of Ports and Shipping and Southern Development, four institutions which only support the subject of ports and shipping have been allocated and no agencies nor institutions have been allocated for Southern Development. Two authorities, including the Technology Agency and its affiliates, have been allocated under the Non-Cabinet Ministry of Digital Infrastructure and IT. Following another extraordinary gazette, which was issued on the 26th of this month, since the resignation of Minister Harin Fernando from the post of Minister of Digital Infrastructure Development, it has been allocated to Ajit P. Pereira, who holds office as the Non-Cabinet Minister of the relevant ministry. The science and technology sphere, along with 19 institutions which were removed from Malik Samara Vikrama, have been handed over to Suji Vasena Singha, who is the non-cabinet minister of science. The sole institution allocated to Dr. Harsha De Silva, who is the non-cabinet minister of economic reform and public distribution, is the Institute of Policy Studies. Yet another startling fact which is noted through this gazette is that there is no mention of which ministries will overlook the Sri Lanka Telecommunication Regulatory Commission and Sri Lankan Airlines. As with the statistics of the central bank, the Sri Lankan rupee plunged further to an all-time low against the US dollar yesterday as the selling price reached 184.07 rupees. When Ravi Karanayaka was sworn in as the Minister of Finance in January of 2015, the Sri Lankan rupee stood at 134.03 rupees against the US dollar. During his tenure of two and a half years, the Sri Lankan rupee depreciated by 15.3% or 20.5 rupees to 154.53 rupees against the US dollar by the end of May of 2017. Karnayanaika's successor, Mangala Samaravira, was therefore sworn in as the Minister of Finance in May of 2017. The Sri Lankan rupee, which then stood at 154 rupees against the US dollar, plunged to a new low of 160 rupees against the US dollar by June of 2018. By the 20th of this year, the rupee further plunged to 170 rupees against the US dollar. 
Thereafter, within a period of two months, the Sri Lankan rupee further depreciated by another 10 rupees and by the 23rd of November 2018, the rupee had plunged to 180 rupees against the US dollar. During Minister Mangala Samarvira's tenure as the Minister of Finance, the Sri Lankan rupee had depreciated by 19.11% or by approximately 30 rupees. Speaking to News First, Chandra Jaratna explained the possible reasons for the depreciation of the rupee against the US dollar. The Sri Lankan rupee has depreciated over 16% this year and it's one of the largest declines registered in an year. In the global context, the Asian economies have all been impacted by some of the global issues. But on the other hand, Sri Lanka has had two very different things affecting it. Firstly, in the short term, the world has, and those who assess us, have come to realize that the political stability and the governance stability of this country is fluid. Unfortunately, these issues have led to the investment communities and others looking closely at Sri Lanka's debt performance. Now here we have come across the third and the biggest problem. We have a debt overhang and that's going to get worse into the future. Every year we export half of what we import. So if we make 60% out of value addition out of exports, which I think is too high, maybe 40%, 60% to pay for twice that amount that we have to pay. So therefore, we have a shortfall of at least 70% in our import-export or the trade balance. So all these compounded together will mean that the country will need to continue to roll over its past debts because it cannot pay off the past debts. And we cannot see some of the investments that have been put in to pay the past debts giving cash flows enough to pay for them. Then what happens? We have to take new debt to meet the new differences every year between the imports and the exports. United People's Freedom Alliance parliamentarian Dala Salaperma made a revelation about an attempt made to increase the number of ministerial portfolios. There was a huge fight in the name of democracy and the constitution. They said that they achieved victory. Now what are the so-called guardians of democracy doing now? They are struggling to distribute the ministerial portfolios. The cabinet doesn't have to be 30 or less. How did they make 117 raise hands in parliament? They promised the Tamil National Alliance the position of the opposition leader. Range Bandara said the same thing. They made 117 raise their hands by making such promises. And now they want to increase the number of ministerial positions. Section 46 of the constitution clearly says that the number of cabinet ministers should not exceed 30. There is a way to do that, and that is by forming a national government. Section 45, subsection 5 of the constitution defines what a national government is. It says, quote, where the recognized political party or the independent group which obtained the highest number of seats in parliament forms a national government, unquote. So what are they going to do now? There is one MP who represents the Muslim Congress. The United National Party has joined hands with that one MP to form a government and calls it the national government. What are they trying to do? They are trying to do this so they can increase the number of cabinet ministers by 20. Identity cards were presented for the tourism-friendly three-wheelers in the Colombo area during an event today. The event took place under the auspices of Minister of Tourism Development, Wildlife and Christian Religious Affairs, John Amarathunga. <laughs> Everyone cannot obtain a ministerial portfolio after the formation of a government that cannot be seen anywhere in the world. Some people will obtain it according to a tradition we have established. Others can give their support to run the government. Nothing will change even though certain people shout. People who are over 70 and 80 should stay at home. People who engage in meritorious activities are given ministerial portfolios. John Amaratunga does not have a pulse. This is the actual situation. So after giving these positions for these old people, this has been a mess. There are young parliamentarians and they should be given these positions to work. Yeah. 
JVP Provincial Councillor Samantha Vidyaratna expressed the following views regarding ministerial portfolios. Range has put on a great show saying that he refused to accept the 500 million rupees and the ministerial portfolios offered to him by the opposition. He stated that these steps were taken to ensure democracy is protected. If he was offered 500 million rupees, this should have been reported to the bribery commission and steps should have been taken to identify those who offered these bribes. So does that mean that Ranim Vikramasinghe promised even more to Range Bandara? To not accept the 500 million rupees? Have these problems started due to these promises being broken? Media spokesperson of the Tamil National Alliance, M.A. Sumandiran, convened a media briefing in Jaffna today. Uh, February the UNP, JVP and V agreed to bring forward a new draft for a constitution before the 4th of February next year. There has been a request from around 21 individuals from the SLFP to join forces with the government. We believe they too will join us within this month. We also believe if that happens, the president will turn this into a national government. When that happens, over 150 votes will be obtained when we consider the JVPs and our votes. We will not claim any ministerial portfolio within this government until the issues of the Tamil people are resolved. I have been saying that Swaminathan should be removed from his ministerial portfolio for more than two years in Parliament. I was the one who suggested that his ministry should be taken under the Prime Minister. We as the TNA support the Prime Minister holding this portfolio. Constitutionally, he cannot hold office as the Minister of Law and Order. Therefore, the President's act is wrong. I assume it will be given to someone very soon. The President said one party alone cannot be favoured when considering charges against war crimes. He added, if so, both parties who are in the wrong should be released. The 144th model village built under the Samata Sevana housing programme was declared open by the Minister of Housing, Construction and Cultural Affairs, Sajit Premadasa. The Ranvianpura model village constructed in the Pulya Kulama area of Putram district consists of 21 houses. The cost incurred for this project is estimated to be 21.3 million rupees. This model village consists of water, electricity and other infrastructure facilities. Deeds were presented to the house owners while spectacles and professional equipment were also distributed in line with the event. The Cultural Affairs Development also donated 125,000 rupees each to five artists as medical funds. Starting from tomorrow, I will also ask Range every day how many model villages we built. They have forsaken development. A few weeks ago, the leader of the Flower Bird Party gave membership to several MPs without the knowledge of the President. However, these MPs now deny that they obtained such a membership. When this issue is discussed in Parliament, these MPs panicked. Now the term flower bud is prohibited in Parliament. If we speak about it, several parliamentarians' memberships will also be threatened. <laughs> I am indebted to every UN peer, therefore I will not leave the UNP. Even if they offer me money or cabinet positions, my only objective is to strengthen you. A program organized to distribute school equipment among children from low-income families was held in Siddha Mullakottava today. Several MPs, including the leader of the National Freedom Front, Vimal Veeravansa and MP Bandhru Gunavardhana attended this event. The old Ranil has emerged again as soon as he was appointed. All the relatives of Ranil Vikramasinghe, including Sagala, Akila, Mangala and Malik, received ministerial portfolios. They are not related in the way we think. They are some other type of relatives. Those people received all the high-end ministries and Range Bandara was left with none. Prime Minister Rani Vikram Singh obtained blessings from the Somoti Super this morning. The Prime Minister and others called on the Chief Incumbent Venerable Pahamune, Sumangala Thera and obtained blessings.
They also visited the Galbihara in Polon Narva. They obtained blessings from Anunayaka of Askiri chapter, Venerable Venderuve Upali Thero. The Prime Minister also washed the sacred feet of Buddha statue resting at the Galbihara. Attending a book distribution ceremony in Dehibala, Chief Minister of the Western Province, Isra Devapriya, expressed the following views. There were floods in the north. Even though the president was overseas at that time, he took all the necessary steps to ensure the people of Kilinochi were taken care of. On the other hand, Prime Minister Vikramasinghe was in Nuralia. As the Prime Minister, he had a responsibility to visit the people of Kilinochi. He was within the capacity to do more than the President, who was overseas. This is the present situation in our country. A leader who cannot prioritize the needs of the people is not capable to engage in politics in the country. <laughs> Following an event held at the Patna Malvasril Dharma Vijaya Temple in Hungama, opposition leader Mahinda Rajapaksa expressed his views on the crisis taking place in the present government. They are fighting due to disagreements over the appointments of ministerial portfolios. Two days or two months? Let's wait and see what happens after two days. This is an era where the underworld rules. People are killed to the same tune as killing dogs. However, the government has no answer to this. I think the ruling party is preparing for elections. There might be a presidential election this year. Provincial council elections will be held sooner or later. We demand for parliamentary elections to be held. However, those who think they will lose are against this idea. <laughs> It is clear that the lifespan will be very short. Following a unanimous decision made by the Bar Council, Bar Association of Sri Lanka is expected to write to President Maitri Parasri Sena and the Constitutional Council urging that judicial appointments to fill vacancies in the apex courts be made as quickly as possible. Quoting the Secretary of the BASL, Kaushalya Navaratna, the Ceylon Today reported that the BASL will be sending the letter in the course of the first week of January 2019. Secretary of the Bar Association of Sri Lanka said, and I quote, Our concern is to ensure that the procedure and process is not disturbed. Therefore, it is a must that the CADA is put in place in the Supreme Court and the Court of Appeal, unquote. However, when News First spoke to the President of the Bar Association of Sri Lanka, U.R. De Silva, he said that their stance on this matter will be confirmed and communicated on Monday. Gamadha visited the locals in Kalek Kumukweva Talava who have been constantly battered by the difficulties in obtaining clean drinking water in the area. The Gamadha team was accompanied by a group of officials from the Central Bearings and Machinery Private Limited. This footage is sufficient to describe the manner in which the villagers residing in the Kale Kumbukweva area in Talava Anuradhapura obtained water for consumption for several decades. The end result of consuming this water was the residents of Kale Kumbukweva topping the list as the village with the highest number of victims of chronic kidney disease. Sarat Kumara, a Navy officer by profession, even gifted his personal plot of land for this drinking water project, defining generosity at its best. The drinking water project, which includes the provision of a water purification machine to the Kale Kumbukwava, was launched today under the Gammed the 1000 Projects Initiative. <laughs> Central Bearings and Machinery Private Limited provided financial aid to this project. Johan Tennakorn of Central Bearings and Machinery Private Limited, along with several senior officials of the Capital Maharaja organization and representatives of the GUM at the initiative, were present at this event. The angle in which politicians see is not enough. Water levels in the wells have reduced and now there is competition among those who sell water to the villagers. The villagers who earn their money with great difficulty spend all of it to purchase water. 
One cannot imagine the amount of money we spend to buy water. Anyone can survive with hunger, but not with thirst. All faculties of the Rajarat University except for its medical and agriculture faculties have been closed until further notice. Accordingly, the faculties of Management Studies, Social Sciences and Humanities, Applied Science and Technology have been closed. University officials have informed all students to vacate their hostels before 10 this morning. The letter further states that the demands of the students have already been submitted to the Governing Council of the University. All students of the Rajarat University, except those at the Medical Faculty, have launched a strike. This is over several demands, including the annulment of class suspension imposed on 16 students. This is the most critical point where the university students have fought for their rights. The administrative department closes the university for the slightest issue. We will continue with the steps we have taken so far. The Inter-University Students' Federation convened a media briefing in Kalama today to speak about several issues in the Rajarata University. After the changes of governments, they had several chances to speak about power struggles, positions of Prime Minister and Opposition Leader. But even after they won their battles and democracy, they have not been able to serve justice to our brothers who have been in tents for months. The Rajarat University does not have enough water filters for more than 6,000 students as there are no provisions allocated. There is only one hostel canteen for around 4,000 female students in the university. There are no programs to determine where the IT faculty will be built or about the syllabus of the IT scheme. <laughs> Uh, military Athlete of the Year, female, is Niluka Gitani Rajasekara. Are you the Military Athlete of 2018? Sports First, Allianz Platinum Awards 2018. In sports news, the fourth day of the second and final test between Sri Lanka and New Zealand took place in Christchurch today. Now chasing a target of 660 runs for victory, visitor Sri Lanka ended the day requiring another 429 runs to win with four wickets in hand. And that's a wrap of this edition of Prime Time News. Thank you very much for joining us. We'll be back with more news later on. Thank you for joining. Take care. Good night. Thank you.